We do want to say welcome to you. We'd invite you to continue our worship together by going to God's Word. We're in Ephesians. We're going to be here for a long time, so just get very comfortable in this book, Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at two verses today, verses 13 to 14. I should tell you, just by some level of admission, that I love Star Wars. It feels good to get that off my chest. Uh, Yeah, you're right. So I love Star Wars. Our family enjoys Star Wars. We're really enjoying, at least the the boys in our family, the book of Boba Fett. Um, So Disney Plus, go get your subscription, go watch it. The Mandalorian, it's been great. Uh, We're tuned in, I mean, every week. And I think that love of Star Wars was cultivated in my life very, very early, very young. You know, when, my, um, when I was growing up as a kid in Houston, Texas, we had one of these old school VCRs. I don't even know if you can find one of these anymore, maybe on eBay, but it had like the top deck. And some of you don't even know that are younger what, what a VCR is, but it had this cassette rack that popped open and you would put the VHS cassette there and then pop it down, thank you. And uh, I remember that we had to wedge like a piece of foil on the play button because the play button would not stick. And for one summer, uh, I just watched The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi like almost every day. It probably drove my parents crazy now I think about that. But, you know, I mean, this is before the day of, you know, instant gratification like Netflix. And so, you know, I just absorbed those movies. And one of my favorite movies to this day is Empire Strikes Back. And one of my favorite scenes in that film is when Luke is stuck at Dagobah. You know, it's a swamp. And you got the little puppet Jedi Master Yoda. And he has to go to the aid of his friends in Bespin and Cloud City. And he has to get his X-Wing that has been submerged in the swampy waters out. And uh, Yoda says, well, you know, do or do not, there is no try, right? So try to get out the X-Wing with the Force, and Luke tries and fails miserably. And then, you know, the little puppet green uh, Jedi Master Yoda lifts up the X-Wing, it soars overhead, and it comes down on dry ground. And, you know, you got the anthem, you know, John Williams music. I mean, it's just a great, great scene. Now, why do I spend so much time belaboring something from Empire Strikes Back? Uh, The reason why is because we're talking about the Holy Spirit this morning. And I believe that many Christians mistakenly, heretically, really equate the Holy Spirit with the force as some sort of inanimate object that may do some things for us. Maybe we can harness the power of the Holy Spirit, but we are gravely, gravely mistaken if that's our approach The Holy Spirit is a person. Holy Spirit provides works and comfort for the life of the believer. And one of the things that is so striking in the first part of the first chapter of Ephesians is how much Paul belabors the point of what the Father does, what the Son does, and now what the Spirit does. Uh, You probably didn't even realize it this morning, but all the songs that we chose to sing this morning have some aspect of Trinitarian worship to them. Uh, as we are being called to give an account to the, the great work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Today we're focusing intently on the work of the Holy Spirit, and we see in this passage several things. We see that the Holy Spirit has enabled us to hear and to believe Uh, He seals us, Paul says, and he exhorts us to endure in this Christian life. And and all three of these ministries are present, some by implication, some by direct statement. And so let me read to you, this is again the conclusion of a long, long sentence that started in verse 3 and goes all the way to verse 14 in Ephesians chapter 1. But Paul says this specifically about the Holy Spirit in verse 13, in Him, and the referent here is Christ, in Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. It's been said that we might think of God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, the Trinitarian uh, uh, existence of God 
eternally existing in three persons as maybe three branches of systematic theology where we focus on God the Father, and Paul does this in the work of creation and the work of providence. And we also see the Son, how the Apostle Paul helped us understand this last week, that the Son has accomplished our salvation through His cosmic work of redemption on the cross. Here we see the benefits of our salvation directly applied to us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit makes our salvation efficacious and makes our salvation real and tangible and something that we can experience on a regular day-to-day, minute-by-minute basis. The Holy Spirit is really what makes God real to us. The Holy Spirit, again, is not a mystical force. It is not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a person. And as such, the Holy Spirit is part of our life on a day-to-day basis and minute-by-minute basis as He is resident with us and reminding us and exhorting us to remember the great benefits of what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. There is an experiential aspect, I believe, to this doctrine of the Holy Spirit that should enrapture our hearts and our souls this morning with praise to God for His glorious grace. Now, I say all that, and I know that there are some aspects of this doctrine of the Holy Spirit that are veiled in some degree of of mystery. And the reason why is because there is less explicit biblical data and revelation about the Holy Spirit just in comparison to the degree of revelation that we have to God the Father and certainly God the Son. You you may take some time this week and just look at Jesus' words in what's called the Upper Room Discourse, specifically from John 13 to John 17, but really 14, 15, and 16 of the Gospel of John, Jesus gives us much information and detail about the Holy Spirit. He calls Him the paraclete. Uh, The paraclete uh, uh, was essentially a lawyer or an advocate that would come alongside and help the disciples as Jesus says, it is actually better for me to go away from you so that I might send another helper or advocate or the paraclete or the Holy Spirit to you, that He would remind you of the truths that I have taught you, that He would empower you in a world that is going to hate you, that He would go before you and convict the world of sin so that you don't have to do that. The Holy Spirit is coming, and He has been promised through the ministry of God the Father in the, Holy, in the Old Testament, through the Holy Prophets, and Jesus says, on account of what I'm going to go do at the cross, I will send Him to you. Now, again, that's quite a mouthful, and so I might just say this, that the Heidelberg Catechism, the 53rd Heidelberg Catechism, asks this very specific plain question directed to children, but also directed to each one of us. The question is very specific, what do you believe concerning the Holy Spirit? And the writers of the Catechism said this, first, He is together with the Father and the Son, true and eternal God. Second, He is also given to me to make me by true faith share in Christ and all His benefits, to comfort me and to remain with me forever." So we've answered the question, at least somewhat specifically, who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? What are His ministries? Well, the first thing that needs to be said, as the Catechism answers here, is that the Holy Spirit is as much God as God the Father and God the Son. And we as believers, as Christians, do not believe in three gods, and we don't believe that God wears three different hats. One day he's wearing God the Father hat and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. That has been resoundingly condemned as heresy throughout the history of the church, and we do well to echo that. But we don't believe that God is somehow three different miniature gods somehow working together as one big God. That's also heretical. 
The, the doctrine of the Trinity is always going to be somewhat mysterious to us. We don't have the capacity to fully understand this, but we believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all equally God, and yet they are distinct persons. Uh, a, a great example of this is actually in Acts chapter 5. You might take some time there this week and go look at that. But it is there that uh, God the Spirit is equated to God. Because do you remember there that there was actually lying to the Holy Spirit? Peter says, if you lie to the Spirit, you lie to God. The Spirit, as we've said, can convict and change hearts. He makes us new in the work of the new birth, of regeneration. He is the source of the Holy Scriptures. And also, Jesus includes the Holy Spirit in His great commission. Go, therefore, in the name, not names, but the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus understood the Holy Spirit to be God. And the Holy Spirit, we would say, as I've already said, has a personality. He is a person. Now, we use that word a lot differently as theologians and as believers than we think about personality of another human being, that they're an introvert or extrovert or, you know, phlegmatic or, you know, melancholy or like the, the animals or a golden retriever or a lion or an otter, right? Uh, we think of personality in those terms. God does not have a personality like that. But when we talk about the personhood of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit has emotion, the Spirit has intelligence, and the Holy Spirit has a will. The implications here are that we can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Now, I say that in our tradition, knowing that that might make some of us a little bit nervous. And, and the, the practice, at least, on kind of in the Bible church movement has been, I think, to some degree, downplay the significance and ministry of the Holy Spirit because we see so much other abuse in the charismatic traditions, and we say, well, we don't want to be snake handlers. And so, how do we go and kind of almost subordinate the work of the Holy Spirit and focus intently on the work of Christ? And to some degree, that's appropriate. Jesus said in the Upper Room Discourse that the Holy Spirit, the Helper, will come alongside and draw your attention to me, to Jesus. And so, to some degree, that's certainly appropriate. But we should not feel tension here, and we should not feel some level of embarrassment to ask the questions about what the Holy Spirit does for us. All illustrations, if you know me well enough, I, I abhor all illustrations of the Trinity. I think they're all just grotesquely, grotesquely heretical, okay? But I'm going to use one this morning. <laughs> um, and, that's right, yeah. And I don't like it, but I, I find to some degree maybe this is helpful, all right? So imagine you have a family in a forest, and the forest is ablaze, and there is a desperate attempt to rescue the people that are in this, in this very desperate situation of a forest fire. But there's no way out, and there's only one way out for them to get out of this forest fire, and that is to be airlifted out of the flames. They can't get out on their own. And so we have this helicopter that begins to fly and notices this family crying out for help. And in the helicopter, you have a pilot, but you also have someone who drops down on a rope and actually rescues the family and through his work ascends up in the helicopter to rescue them to safety. One of the things that Paul has done in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, is he highlights the different aspects of our redemption by highlighting the different persons in the Godhead. So it's been said that God the Father is a little bit like the pilot who surveys the scene and understands from his point of view and perspective, the forest is on fire and something must be done. And there's another firefighter that drops down into the flames at great risk to himself. And it's been said that that firefighter is a little bit like the work of God the Son who entered into the flames on our behalf. And he secured the safety of the people. But then the rope, and again, I don't like this illustration that much, but I'll use it. The rope is a little bit like the work of the Holy Spirit who makes that security possible. And that all three, the pilot, the rope, and the other the firefighter who dropped down, work on behalf of the safety of the family that needs it. 
the Holy Spirit, some other aspects, and I'm going to go a little fast here. You can go on our Church Center app, find some more notes, some other scriptures that this might be interesting to you. This is also a shameless plug for our Knowing God Bible study on Wednesday night where we plunge the depths of systematic theology, and, but just a, a few other aspects of the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. He is at the beginning of our salvation. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, convicts the world of the sin around, him, around us. The Holy Spirit does the work, as I've said, of the new birth, of regeneration in our heart, Paul tells us in Titus 3, 5, John chapter 3, that the Holy Spirit is the one that actually does the work. And then the Holy Spirit resides with us and continues the work in reminding us and empowering us of the work of our salvation. He's with us throughout the entirety of our life. And again, Jesus said it's actually better for him to leave in John 14 and send the Holy Spirit. And the key to our success and endurance in the Christian life is not just your intestinal fortitude, but it is actually the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you, calling you to endure, calling you to consider again, reminding you of the greatness of the work of Jesus Christ. And so through this, the Holy Spirit illuminates our minds so that when we read the Word of God or we hear a sermon, our hearts go, yes! That's what the Holy Spirit does inside of us as individuals and the Holy Spirit resides in the corporate unity of a body of Christ called a church reminding us of our unity and our connection with one another as brothers and sisters and calling us to love and to sacrifice for one another, illuminating our minds and our hearts to the greatness of these works. The Holy Spirit, Paul tells us in Romans 8, actually intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Sometimes you don't know how to pray. Sometimes you're in the depths of your sorrow or the depths of your pain. It is there that the Spirit of God intercedes for you. And the Spirit of God brings us before God the Father. He enables us to live with the fruit of the Spirit. It's not your power, your willpower that calls you to love and good deeds and to exhibit the life and the fruit of the Spirit. It is the work of the Holy Spirit within us. The Holy Spirit gives us unique giftings in the corporate unity of the body of Christ, not so that you would indulge in those giftings so that other people would say, wow, you're really gifted. But the purpose of a spiritual gift is that you would use those gifts for the edification and further maturity of other brothers and sisters. So the Spirit is not the force like Yoda would use the force. The Spirit as a person. And I want to return to our passage here, and I want you to look at three things here with me. You see that the Holy Spirit works and has worked to enable us to hear and to believe. In verse 13, in Him, in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, and I'll just say this, were sealed. The main verb here is you were sealed by the Holy Spirit. We'll get to that in a moment. But there are two, at least in the Greek, two what are called participles that work to help us understand how this sealing took place. And it's those two verbs that you see in your English text, having heard and having believed. And so let's look at the hearing here. As we've seen that Paul is emphatic that the Holy Spirit is enabling us to see and to hear with spiritual eyes and to see with spiritual eyes in our heart. In fact, he'll actually pray this for the church next week, that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. That is a ministry, a direct benefit of the work of the Holy Spirit. I love how this works because this works through the proclamation of God's Word either through preaching or through evangelism. And Paul makes this very specific here. He says, you heard what? What did you hear? The gospel of your salvation. How did you hear it? You heard it through the proclamation, the outward call and invitation, and the Spirit worked on your heart. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, nothing is more dangerous than to put a wedge between the Word and the Spirit to emphasize either one at the expense of the other. It is the Spirit and the Word. 
the Spirit upon the Word, and the Spirit in us as we read the Word, that the Spirit opens our eyes and helps us to hear. In other words, we wouldn't hear the gospel and the content of the gospel, and we certainly wouldn't believe in the gospel if it wasn't for a work of the Holy Spirit. And so, what does believe mean? When Paul says, you heard and you believe, there's an outward declaration that Jesus has come into real space, time, and history, lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial, substitutional death for the sinner, was buried for three days, rose again three days later, and now sits at God's right hand. That has happened. And the invitation of the gospel is that you would cast yourself upon that truth and that you would hear, not just intellectually understand, but that you would hear the good news of the gospel, and you would believe it. You wouldn't just understand it. There would be the content of the gospel, as the Reformers said. There would be a conviction that indeed this is true, but it also needs to be a consent where you rest in these truths for your salvation. Nobody can do that for you. I can't do that. But what I can do as a preacher is to make the outward declaration of the call, and that through the Spirit you hear and you respond. One of the things Paul tells us in Romans 10 is that how can they hear without a preacher? Or how can they hear the work of the gospel without an evangelist? That totally puts to rest any misunderstanding and gross misunderstanding of what Paul says in Romans, or rather Ephesians 1, uh, 3 through 5, about the work of God's election. That even Paul understood that the work of redemption and the work of belief in the gospel goes through the gospel call, so every single one of us are enlisted and empowered to be witnesses to that gospel. And so, Paul the Holy Spirit says, go, go. What are you waiting for? Go, make a proclamation. It is this word of truth that is the word of your salvation. As Paul goes on, he says at the end of verse 13, the Holy Spirit and the sealing of his work. He says, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The promise of the Holy Spirit came all, all, all the way back, all the way back through the Hebrew prophets, through prophets like Joel in chapter 2, where he says, in the last days, God will pour out his Spirit. But when Peter preaches at Pentecost, he says, that day has now come, and that the Holy Spirit, who was promised by God through the prophets, has now come and has now rested upon you and is now empowering you. This promise now seals you and now pulls you out of the world and God places his mark upon you. It's the mark of his redemption. It's the Holy Spirit. In the ancient world, such sealing would have a lot of different effects. It would, uh, it would, it would, it would be a, a symbol, say, for example, a, a king's seal. It would be a symbol of security. We see this in the life of Daniel when he's thrown into the lion's den, and Darius places his seal on the entrance to the lion's den, meaning nobody better break that seal. If that seal is broken in the morning, I know that Daniel has been tampered with. It's a sign of security. It's a little bit like a, a lock that would be something, or a sign of a, a security of a letter. You know that you are the first person to actually read that letter. It's also a sign of authenticity. A, a seal would be placed on official documents that would bear the authentic uh, representation of the sender. We, we do the same thing with sports memorabilia today. You know, you can go buy, uh, oh, I probably shouldn't say this, a Kevin Durant Thunder jersey. It's a little salt in the wound for all of us, I know. And you know that it's authentic because it has a seal of authenticity. Another way that seals were used, though, would be as a symbol of ownership. If you were into cattle, you might brand cattle. Uh, true story, I did a wedding for um, 
uh, a couple down in Texas, and they had this agricultural background. One went to Texas A&M, he was the elect, and the other person went to, <laughs> sorry, so, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, spontaneity gets you in trouble as a preacher. Um, all right, so the other person went to Texas Tech, and, and they kind of merged their um, kind of last names together and made a branding iron and actually branded at their wedding ceremony a hide. And it was kind of this really cool thing. I told them, I said, man, if you're really committed to each other, you would brand each other. Um, they, didn't do, they didn't do that. Um, I told him that in premarital counseling. I did not say that during the ceremony. Um, but, uh, but, but a, a brand like on an, on an animal would be a sign of ownership. Uh, they didn't do this with sheep. They actually would clip their ears a lot of times. It would be a seal of the owner of the she- as the shepherd owning these sheep. And, and the same thing is true here. We are sealed by the Holy Spirit. We are, we are marked. We are God's. He owns us bought us through the work and the blood of Jesus Christ. We are secure in Him, that the Holy Spirit is a security, and the Holy Spirit is also a symbol of authenticity. Nobody is a believer in Jesus Christ. Nobody is born again without the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit. How do you get the Holy Spirit? Not through money, not through works, not through doing enough good deeds, but by hearing and believing, Paul says. The third thing he says here is that the Holy Spirit enables our endurance, and this is somewhat implied here, but look again, verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. Paul uses a very special word here. It's a word that we're very familiar with. The Greek word is erebon, and it literally means down payment or earnest money. Okay, so if you bought a house recently or perhaps a car or another significant financial purchase, very likely if you had to take a loan out, you would put money down as a guarantee that you will make the rest of your payments. And the, the symbol here is, is very similar. Paul uses the same language here in 2 Corinthians 1.22. He uses the same idea in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I think it's in verse 30, that, that Paul is saying here that the Holy Spirit is our down payment of something greater to come. There's more to come. That gives me great, great peace to know as we look at life right now, sometimes you don't live your best life now. Sometimes you go through pain. Sometimes you go through sorrow, suffering. God has said there's coming a day that your inheritance will be enjoyed in its fullness, but not yet. And as a promise and assurance that that day is yet to come, let me give something to you that is of infinite eternal value, my own spirit, that will rest in you individually, that will rest in your churches. And the Holy Spirit reminds us of the benefits of our salvation. Why does this help us with our endurance? Well, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is He reminds us of these things, as I've said. I heard the story about a man uh, that the BBC reported of, uh, and he had a luxury boat in a Swedish harbor. And true story, I looked it up, and uh, somehow uh, that boat got loose from its moorings and for two years literally just floated around in the harbor aimlessly. It didn't crash anything miraculously, but just kind of floated around And the authorities had no idea who this boat belonged to. Finally, this guy claimed it after two years. And it was a luxury, it was a luxury yacht. And and, and they said, well, why didn't you claim this until now? He said, well, honestly, I'm so wealthy, I just forgot about it. Uh, Right. (laughs) I mean, I don't even forget about like quarters in my pocket, you know? (laughs) But the Holy Spirit reminds us of our great inheritance but he also is security for that great inheritance. Now, I missed the boat a long time ago in cryptocurrency. You know, I don't have any Bitcoin. I probably should have some. You guys that are smarter than me can help me understand this. But I'm told that there are people, and one of them is a man named Stefan Thomas. He's a computer programmer from San Francisco. And he bought a lot of Bitcoin, about 7,000 Bitcoin, when it was worth very, very little. And it's, I don't really understand how this works, but it's all like contained on these hard drives. But he also encrypted them to where if you enter in a wrong password 10 times, 
You're forever locked out. The problem with Stefan is he wrote down his password and he cannot find that piece of paper anywhere. And so he's put eight times different passwords. And that Bitcoin is worth, I'm told, about $200 million. $220 million, actually, to be exact. Uh, maybe less because of this last week. <laughs> Do you ever kind of lie awake at night thinking about things like that? Maybe not your Bitcoin, but you wonder if you're rich and you wonder if you'll somehow forsake your inheritance. The Holy Spirit is a reminder that you need not worry. You are secure. You are secure in the work of redemption. I think the word inheritance here is used in one of two ways. Paul says that God is our inheritance, and it's been said that God is the gospel, meaning that the effects of the gospel are that we enjoy God forever, and we can certainly enjoy Him now. And that is the sum total of our eternal, infinite inheritance. But God also calls the nation of Israel first, as well as Jews and Gentiles alike, as His own inheritance. Majestically so. That God calls us to Himself. Again, as I've said before, we are trophies of His grace. And that as we enjoy God, somehow God also enjoys Himself by enjoying us. And Paul reminds us of this whole idea, as we've seen this phrase repeated now for the third time, to the praise of His glory, to the praise of His glory, to the praise of His glory. God has given us the Holy Spirit ultimately so that the Holy Spirit would call to mind and call to heart these wonderful truths that we've been looking at in the last few weeks to the praise of His glory. Ran across this story as a little way to conclude today as we think about our inheritance, as we think about the down payment and look forward to a better day tomorrow. There was a little boy and his father, and the mom passed away a long time ago. And this was a long time ago, by the way. And the father promised his little boy that they would go on a picnic together the next day. And the father dutifully packed all the lunches together and packed the car the night before. And the son was so excited, never been on a picnic before. And the little boy uh, finally was sent to go to bed. And the father tucked him in and did everything he needed to. And the little pitter-patter of feet comes out. And the son wakes up his father. He says, Dad, Dad. I mean, I have a lot of experience with this. Dad, I can't sleep. I can't sleep. I'm so excited about our picnic tomorrow. I said, son, you need to get to bed so that you get a good night's rest so that that picnic is enjoyable for both of us. So go get a good night's rest. Put him back to bed. Maybe about an hour later, 30 minutes later, put her pat her feet. Father's fast asleep. Dad, 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 dad. What? What? Dad, I, I, I can't sleep, but I'm thinking about the picnic, and I just want to thank you for tomorrow. Father, I want to thank you for tomorrow. I want to thank you for the down payment of our inheritance. It's coming. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your truth of your word. Father, we thank you for the enjoyment of these passages these truths in the last few weeks, Lord, as these truths have washed over us like an ocean and wave after wave after wave that have crested over us, reminded us of these eternal benefits that we have, the benefit of the Holy Spirit. Father, we would be remiss if we didn't pray today for anyone that doesn't know these benefits, that has never come to a place of simple belief, trust, of simple understanding, and consent, Lord, as they give their life to Jesus, as they rest in what He's done for them as their Savior, that, Lord, that very simply, right where they are, whether they're listening to this on the internet, whether they're listening to it here in person, they've never done that. They just simply say, I believe. And at the end of this service, Lord, they'd have the courage and the boldness to tell someone about that. Father, for Metropolitan Bible Church, that we would rest in these great truths and this great deposit that you've given us, the sealing, the security that we have in the Holy Spirit. And through the Spirit, we would not just be reminded of these great truths, but we would live in light of them and that we would be unified as your body, as your people, on mission for you to declare the greatness of who you are to the praise of your glory. And let us do that now as we sing. It's in Christ's name. Amen.